if you've ever doubted that God loves you, and we do that sometimes because we're not always so smart and we can be insecure, then this video has four attempted proofs that he certainly does love every single one of us. It's metaphysically impossible that he would not love us. He's proved that with the crucifixion. He tells us again and again through Holy Scripture, through his revelation there, and we can know it through experience. This is the final video in a series of three. The first one looked at St. Thomas's demonstration that where there is love, we truly live in the person we love, and they live in us. The second video in the series applied this to our love for God, and this third video examines it in terms of God's love for us. There are links to the first two videos in the description below. Considering four effects of God's love for you, firstly, the beloved is in the lover, that is, you are held in God by his intellect, by his mind. God thinks of you, you're on his mind. This is what gives you your identity, not just your nature, but who you are. If God were not thinking of you constantly, you would not have a form. Even if we think we are changeable or unstable, perhaps it is that God looks at what he calls us to be. He's looking at the final product. That's why he doesn't cast us off when we're not quite there yet. And then you're held in God by his will, by his heart. He loves you, that is, he wills you to be, otherwise you would not exist. And we don't simply exist, but God wants the good for us, even salvation, giving his only son to die for each one of us individually. He didn't just die on the cross for mankind in general, but as St. Paul writes, I live in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself for me, personally, individually. The saints say that Jesus was willing to go to the cross for every single one of us singularly, individually. So these first two considerations that we have an identity and that we exist demonstrate that God's thinking of us constantly and loves us constantly. Nothing can exist if he didn't hold it in being. For God is love. He can only love. It's his nature. Agitur sequitur esse. That means action follows being. A thing does according to its own nature. It would not be an ability or a power to go against one's nature. It would be a failure, a lack. But there is no lack in God. Therefore, he cannot not love. It would be a disorder or a failure in him not to love something he created. Certainly God loves you. And at the same time, the lover is in the beloved. That is, God is in each one of us with his intellect. He wants to know us better, so he puts us to the test. That is, he confronts us with questions, with situations, with choices to make. Now, of course, God knows us already, but he does this, in fact, so that we can grow to fulfill his plan for us. I mean, when you have a question, does God exist? Or did Jesus die on the cross? Why did he die on the cross? How does that save us from our sins? Where do these questions come from? We might think it's just us coming up with these, but often it's God whispering these questions to our soul. He's interested in our growth, our approaching him. Or if you're in a dilemma, a difficult situation, God will show us there that he's always with us and carries us through. So we come out of it, and sometimes it takes a long time looking back to see the benefit of it, but we come out of it knowing God better, that he's always there and that he can pull us out of any mire no matter how deep. And especially if we've gone into it in order to be faithful to him, then he's definitely not going to let us down. The fourth effect that God is in us with his will he knows our trials. He has compassion on our suffering. He delights when we get to know him. The scripture is full of examples of this. Our experiences matter to him. Looking at the explanations from the earlier videos, it's as if because God is in us, he experiences what we experience. So when we're suffering, God in a sense feels it. When we are rejoicing, God in a sense shares in that. Now, because we're not all so strong in philosophy and metaphysics and we can't all readily see that the fact that we have an identity and that we exist is a metaphysical proof that God loves us, God tells us the same again and again and again through the scriptures. In Psalm 144 we read, The Lord is sweet to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Isaiah says, My steadfast love shall not depart from you. We might think it's departed. We're wrong. And so the scriptures, if we're reading them daily, they correct us, keep us in the truth. And Jesus seeing a great multitude, and that stands for the whole crowds of the world, he had compassion on them because they were sheep not having a shepherd. He is the shepherd. And then in Zephaniah, the Lord thy God will rejoice over thee with gladness. 
He'll be silent in his love, even if we don't feel God rejoicing in us. Because he's silent, that doesn't mean it's not happening. But sometimes we feel it, that sometimes there's that surge of joy in us, which is the Holy Spirit. Similarly, we can be consoled deeply in suffering and feel these tender darts of love that we are permitted to make a sacrifice for him. Otherwise, how can it be that there's consolation in suffering? Where does this consolation come from, if not from God? But what about our sins? Do our sins put God off us? It's true God hates the sin, yet he loves the sinner. If we say, I've done this terrible thing, or I'm so useless, then our gaze is on ourself, and probably we'll fall into despair. It's necessary to raise our gaze to God, to consider his mercy, and though we review our own sins daily, we must think of him more intensely than we think of ourselves, and this will raise us up. If we die in our sins unrepentant, then we're stuffed. But if we repent and hope in his mercy, we will live eternally in heaven. And God is just, so he asks of us that we love our enemies. Jesus tells us we must give to the undeserving, that if we only love those who love us, then what thanks are due to us? Or if we only do good to those who do good to us, what thanks are due to us? Now, if Jesus expects that we should love those who are opposed to us, against us, or undeserving, then how much more God will do that for us, no matter what condition we're in. And indeed, Jesus says that God is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. We shouldn't let the fact that we are undeserving unsettle us to despair, because we know that all God's grace is freely given. So in summary, that God loves you is proven in that you have an identity and you exist. This means you are in his mind and in his heart, really alive there. And that God dwells in us is indicated in the fact that we can grow, we can improve. God has a plan for us and is working on it. And that we can be consoled even in suffering, which the scriptures demonstrate again and again. If we have faith, if we trust the word of God, then we will believe this even if we can't fully understand it. But it's a sad, sad thing when people don't believe that God loves them. And if any of this video is unconvincing, do leave a comment and I'll try my best to flesh that point out. If we're secure in the knowledge that God loves us, it makes us so much more relaxed and easygoing with everybody around us. And if we get attacked or something, we don't explode and don't lash out because you carry this peace in the knowledge that God loves you. God bless you all.